and he was looking at and me his favorite like, band, Arcade of Dreams. And I'm like, uh, thank you. His best friend, Steve Pearson. <laughs> Andre. Hi, everybody. Just, I only have a couple of ground rules, okay? I won't answer any questions about Kiss. <laughs> Kid. Just don't ask about my mom. Selling stuff, now. Anybody? Nothing? Was Gene Simmons into a sports? Because he always mentioned boxing a lot. You know, for instance, boxing. Was he a boxing fan or anything? Gene, uh, let, me, let me put it to you like this. The only sports Gene's interested in has to do with dim lights, a mattress, and be behind closed doors. No, no. Gene, the, Sports, nothing. Not one thing. Yeah. 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 And there were been times that we were starting out to kind of feel like we overprotected. Mike, can I stick that to my shirt? Overprotected, yeah. Protecting them from themselves most of the time. No, it's, uh, you try to do whatever you can do to keep. Uh, keep them as comfortable as possible, and that's basically, you know, the function. Um, keeping them out of the public side or having them go around the corner where people can't see them so that uh, sometimes if we don't have time to do what, you know, what you guys would like to do, get autographs and pictures or whatever, if we're running late or whatever, that it's not an embarrassing situation for them to look like that they're, you know, snubbing the fans. So. Uh, what, was the reunion tour, did it all go as smooth as Dan Paul always talked like it did uh, with Peter and Ace coming back? Um, no, it didn't. It was uh, like a couple of stories that, that are in the book. It's, uh, it's a, it was a precarious situation. It was, you know, after 17 years, then coming back to form the original band again, a lot of things had changed, you know. Uh, their relationship, you know, from when they first first started to breaking up and then reconciling, it was uh, it was a divided camp. You know, it got better as time went on, but at the beginning, it really was it was it was two separate entities, you know, that were you know working together, but at times there was you know a little bit of friction there. So it, it worked, you know, it was uh, it was a good end to ends to a means, but. You know, at times they had their, you know, disagreements, just like any, you know, like a lot of times Gene would say, you know, just like any family, you know, there's, there's disagreements, but you still love each other. It was still there, their basic care for each other, but they had, you know, a lot of friction at times. Um, on your website, where are you? Yeah. On your website, you talk a little bit about uh, Ace's erratic behavior. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, for twenty-two ninety-five, uh, the erratic behavior is, is going to be explained fully. No, it was, uh, you know, at the beginning of the tour, Ace, um, to be perfectly honest with you, there was a time when, at, for the first two or three weeks of that tour alone, Ace uh, had a really, really high fever and he had the flu. And um, people might have mistaken that for something else, but... Um, this, this flu, because we were doing so much traveling, there was a lot of back and forth stuff, it doesn't give them enough time to relax and recuperate and replenish the things that they need to do and the things that they need to do to get themselves well. The, the time is so short between shows. There's a lot of stuff going on before, after, during, that it doesn't give them enough time to recover. And it, it just took him a long time to get in the swing of things, you know? Because it was different for them rehearsing, you know, before the tour. Um, they were in LA, it was, you know, two or three or four hours, and then you have the rest. Of the, they have the rest of the day to do their thing, and rest and relax. But when you're on the road, it's just go, go, go. And that was, you know, one of the things that uh, that was a problem at the beginning, you know, especially. No. Anybody else? You guys don't start asking don't questions. Raise, I'm going to start asking questions. If you don't raise your hand before, I can't get to you, so keep them raised high.
that you took from each other. <laughs> um, say it again real quick. Well, there's there's several stories that, that I, I do in the book about it. Um, uh, carry, you know, some dangerous situations. Now, when I talk about dangerous, it's different from what you guys might expect, but... You know, when there's like two or three thousand, you know, KISS fans in, uh, you know, Bogota, Colombia, standing outside the airport waiting for us to get off the plane and get in the cars and they're surrounding us, you know, there's certain things that, you know, by my training that I have to do to get us out of that situation or, you know, spur the moment's notice. And there's a couple stories in there like that. That particular, you know, instance comes to mind. But... If you do enough planning and preparation, you know, you don't have to go through those situations. And that's basically how I like to do things. Just you do a lot of planning, a lot of preparation, eliminate a lot of the problems before you even get, you know, to where you're going so you don't have to. Um, I got started. Good, and uh, after playing uh, some professional football, I came back and I was working with a company that does um, t-shirt, t-shirt security. You know, the guys in the yellow jackets and Cali Barricade at the concerts. I work for a company like that out of L.A. And they just happened to get a couple of, uh, couple of contracts to work with a couple of groups on tour two years in a row. And so during the time that I was working with those groups on the road, they saw a lot of good things in me and gave me an opportunity to go out and do it on my own. I, I did a oh. couple of years' work within the buildings doing security, you know, groups, peer group security. That's all I guess. Has anybody ever worked for the swing engine? That I have ever worked for? No. Are you, are you kidding? Be serious. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. I want to know what the, the tensest situation you've ever been in. Tensest situation would have to be, like I was saying, one of the ones that we uh, we went through at, a, uh, at an airport where we were surrounded and uh, looked like there was no way out. But you know, some quick some quick thinking and quick planning, we were able to get out of the situation, you know, without uh, without getting hurt. Yes, I saw uh, Peter, Chris, and Ace Freely during the Bad Boys tour prior to. The and Ace made several references to Peter Crispy and Gay. Is that true or not? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, personally, myself, I've never dated him, so... I mean, but, you know, from all indications, when I was working for him, I'd have to say, no. He is married now, though. Professional wrestling. Yes, for about two seconds, I did think about that, but you know, it just didn't interest me. But it's a great thing. You know, a lot of money. Maybe I'll think about it a little more. Along the bands you've worked with, what is the most creative or extreme thing that a fan has done to get access to things? Um, creative. Um, well, you know, there's always the, the fake laminates, the fake passes that you see, and then there's also the, the deal where someone has a pass from a, a show that's not too far away, you know, from the night before, and it's, it's a valid pass, but it's a different color, because you change colors usually every day, and that's some of the stuff that they use to do it. And then you, you hear all the, all the stories, you know. I'm Ace's brother, you know, I've got to see him, you know, he owes me some money, you know, or uh, I'm, Ace, you know, I'm Gene Simmons' cousin from, you know, way back when, but, you know, you hear all the stories. It's 
usually something about a relative or, you know, then you get to, you know, I've got somebody out here who's sick, you know, they've got cancer. And, you, you know, you take those a little bit more serious and you try to investigate. But, um, you know, it's usually something like that to get backstage. Andre, I'm uh, Bruce Kulik's brother. I just want to ask him over here, right, left, 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 over here. Hey, you doing that? Hi, Rod. Obviously, you got the book thing going on. Uh, are you retired, or are you just kind of taking that back? No, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm still uh, seeking employment. So, if anybody needs any help, you know, security work. You guys back there? Yeah. Okay. As long as you got a checkbook, I'm working. <laughs> but no, I just. Um, I did something last summer with Pat Benatar, and uh, worked with her last summer. And I've been taking a little time off to, you know, concentrate with Mark, Mark Rogers to do this project. And um, you know, I'm still seeking, actively seeking employment, but um, I'm going to try to promote this and do as much as we can to, to get this off the ground and get it rolling. But you know, I'm still, still looking for people to work, work with. I talked to um, Richie Sambora. They're, they're writing. He and John are writing new record and getting ready to record and so I'll probably end up doing some stuff with them, you know, maybe in the fall or the early, you know, early next year. Uh, have you remained in contact with uh, Gene or Paul or have you, uh, did they send you postcards or anything like that? Is there any talk about future employment? Um, we haven't really talked about future employment, but I talked to, you know, pretty much everybody quite a bit. Um, when I was, when I well, finally came to some of the finishing stages of this project. I went to Gene because I wanted him to know what I was doing, and I we sat down and we talked about it. And I showed him, you know, a bunch of stuff, and he liked everything he saw and he gave me the thumbs up, and you know, so. Um, and I've actually sat down with almost everybody that's in the uh, in the in the book and told them about it, you know, giving them a, a warning, so to speak, but. You know, showing them about the project and trying to get their endorsement and their, you know, pat on the back. And they're all pretty happy with what they saw, so I was real happy with that. Of all the bands that you worked for, which one do you think had the most, that you had the most fun? Well, you know, they're, they're all pretty much right up there, but I have to say, you know, it doesn't really matter who you're with, but it's the, the people that you're with and that you're working for. I have to say that you know the groups that I worked with when it was uh, Eric Springer and Bruce Kulick and Gene Paul was one of the best tours I've ever worked on. There have been others too that are right up there, but you know you try to balance the work with the fun that you have, you know, during the off time and the downtime, and that was you know one of the best times that I've ever had. Revenge tour. He probably doesn't want me to talk about yeah, this because he's a Mark Rogers, the writer of the book. He's a real big fan of Nelson. Yeah. <laughs> you see him laughing back there? Look, look at him. He's saying no, but I know deep down inside he's a closet Nelson free. No, he's actually he's, he's a big Kiss fan, but um, um, there was some they're having some trouble. You know, just because of the situations that you get put in traveling situation or the way that the band, you know, how big the band is dictates a lot of the budgetary touring, you know, problems that you have. And uh, Arcade I worked with, it was, a, you know, they were a baby band at the time. That was Stephen Piercy with Rat, with Greg Corey, who used to be with Cinderella. They put together a group called Arcade and toured, you know, for a couple of tours. It was really hard because there wasn't really much money there to support the tour, but um, we had fun otherwise. And uh, Nelson was hard because those two guys, they just didn't get it, you know? They, and, uh, I'll leave it at that, but that was that was a pretty difficult tour. They were young, they thought things were you know, other than they were, and you know, it, was, it was just difficult keeping them out on the road and having as much success as they did if they weren't very happy. But, but too tough. Um, uh, Adam Mitchell before was saying that he enjoyed working with Bruce and Eric best. You're saying you enjoyed working with Bruce and Eric best. Bruce and Eric, you know, what can I say about those two guys? Two fun-loving guys. Do you, do you uh, lead upon Gene 
like working with them better too. Um, I don't know if they like working with them better because you know how can you compare the success and the fun that they had in their earliest, you know, most successful years? Some people would say, but you know, I know that you know I was around in, in, in that family at that part of time, and I could see that there was just you know, Gene, Gene had fun, Paul had fun. You know, we laughed a lot. We had a good time, and um, I have to say that you know, if you ask them the same question, they would say that you know, at that time was probably one of their most favorite times of touring and, and working together as well. You know, it's evident. You can just tell you know, how people were having fun on the road. I did not know Eric. I came uh, just slightly, you know, after Eric was involved. And, you know, after he passed, but, uh, you know, there was still a lot of talk, you know, during the time that I was with him, his name came up a lot, it was always, you know, real fond memories of him, between those guys. Uh, yes. Nobody rides the, bu the bikes but me. I'm the only one that has a heart. It's a fat boy. Anybody familiar with that model? Yeah? Okay. Which artist? Well, the artist, you know, is uh, a little guy, but with an enormous ego. You know, he tries to play it down a little bit, but he's, you know, as far as you know, feet being off the ground, he's, he's pretty well, he's pretty up there. Um, you know, when you look at successful people, especially in the music business, they've been there and done that so much that usually by the time they get to the point where they've been in the business for, like, you know, any longevity, any period of time, that they're pretty well grounded, they, you know. They've had 10 years of people praising on the bank, everybody saying yes. That um, if they haven't really spun out of control by that time, once you get them at that point, they're pretty, they're pretty level. They're pretty so, um, but he's, you know, he was a unique individual. I enjoyed working for him because I enjoy that that music as well. But um, you know, he did a, a lot of things in a real unconventional manner. Kind of even think, well, how could you know, how could how could I even think about doing that? What you're asking me to do, but you ask you to do it anyway. Somebody else. <coughs> yes, and if you want to know about Columbus, Georgia. 2295, Guardian of the Gods, no. It, um, it was a, I don't want to tell the whole thing because it's a, it's a long, involved story, but, you know, the bottom line was basically um, Peter just, he couldn't do it. He couldn't perform. He was, he was worn out, so to speak. And um, it was a question of whether if he played that night, whether he was going to damage himself further to where he didn't have to miss a series of shows rather than missing one show, having a day off, and then going on to the next day to perform and really take care of himself for a couple of days and do it and get well so that he could keep going for the remainder. And that's basically you know, how the decision was made and why it was made like that. But it was one of the hardest things that I ever saw an artist do was to have somebody else sit in because he couldn't perform and it was out of his power to perform, you know, he just physically couldn't do it. So it was really, really a hard, hard thing for him, but, you know, I guess in the long run it was better for everybody involved, him as well as you guys and everybody else involved, the band as well, because uh, the guy that did fill in, you know, it came out really, really well and, um, you know, everybody got to see three quarters of when they came on and they paid to see. Anybody else? Any more questions? You're all set. There's a train on there at any time if you need to go in and ask a question. Email me. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Have a nice day.
No, no. I have never had to. Well, you know, we got to take that back. We did have to go and get. Um, no, that was, a, that was a different group. We were down, I was working with NWA, and he had a couple of opening acts on the tour. One was uh, a rapper called Too Short. And he, his, his lyrics are pretty x rated Thank you. And they had a statue down there that if you said certain words, and they had a list of words, that you would be arrested. And you were going to be taken for, you know, unlawful, whatever it was. So even though I wasn't directly working with him, you know, we had to send somebody down directly after his show. You know, he said some of those words, and he got handcuffed and taken down to jail. But um, the funny thing about it was the NWA who had the same amount of um, X-rated lyrics in their, in a couple of their songs, or in all of their songs, what they would do was they would get all the way up to the point of saying the word, and then they would not say it, but the audience say it. So they accomplished exactly what they wanted to happen, but they didn't get arrested because they didn't actually say the word. Not, the, not when I was working. Maybe before. Russell. I'll talk to you later. Thanks, everybody. This is a great one. I appreciate it. If you want to come back there and see me, I'll be back there. Ace Cosby, everybody. All right, we're going to take a, a quick break. Oh, Andre will be on Bob and Tom tomorrow, so we can catch more of his telltale stuff. We'll take a quick break. Uh, if you're hungry, there's a food place uh, right across the corner here. You can purchase that. But, uh,